there were a good number of modernist masterpieces developed and uh, created, but then the generation that came after them designed or uh, transformed this into some sort of economic functionalism, where the only strategy that was valid was function. And that turned out to be extremely problematic because so many of these buildings or of these design pieces ultimately did not function. They Not only were they ugly and uh, and bad to use, but they actually did not work. And you can see this uh, with, you know, by the fact that so many of the modernist block buildings by now have been imploded because literally they were not fit for human living. It's inherently in us. And uh, an example that I find very convincing is if you look at something called a hand axe, which is this teardrop shape tool that we've been using for basically a million years. It's the oldest and most wildly used tool in human history. Uh, all of them are perfectly symmetrical, no matter if they were found in uh, Asia, in the Africas, in, in the Americas or in Europe, all of them. And they are all gorgeous. The, sim the symmetry, you don't really need for the functioning of it. You can skin that animal just as well with a non-symmetrical tool. So it was made purely because it was, it was made that way because it was perceived to be better looking. And I think that that's one of the great thinking mistakes of the 20th century, is that beauty is somehow a surface issue that's on the side that let's think about the real thing and then let's beautify it at the end a little bit. And I actually see much evidence that beauty is at the extreme heart of what we want from a thing. Uh, if we want to live in it or want to use it or uh, want to be surrounded by it, that this is really a human desire. And I've tried it out many times myself. I mean, most, I don't know, remarkably, and you can try it out if you're in New York, if you switch from one station, train station to the other, from Grand Central, which is a 19th century building, very much in beauty, with beauty in mind, freshly renovated, towards Penn Station, which was t torn down, rebuilt in the 60s as a modernist uh, building. Uh, the, the feeling you have inside of these two buildings is perceivably different and I showed some evidence that if you look at a sentiment map that really looks at Twitter uh, uh, at Twitter and see if there are positive or negative messages coming out of these buildings you can actually measure the difference how people feel in these buildings uh, there is it's interesting because there's a remarkable lack of authoritative research in aesthetics Interestingly, one of the most prominent researchers sits in Vienna, uh, Helmut Leder, I'm in contact with him, and uh, he has shown some, uh, some, uh, uh, some very good evidence how beauty is really at the very, very center of what it means to be human, but there is still much to do. Well, I think that literally can be traced back to World War I, where uh, from the 19th century, beauty was really seen as its own value, basically on one, on one level with goodness. And when World War I showed that so many of the civilized nations were kicking each other's heads in, in the most barbaric kind of way, there was a, a loss of a belief in truth and beauty. Like it be, or in civilization, basically, like you know, it's saying like, if if it's possible that these supposedly high civilizations can be so brutal to each other, uh, what worth could beauty be? And strategies were developed that, of course, are completely understandable at the time, that were that made a very a very conscious choice to to get rid of beauty and probably the most famous of them would be Duchamp's urinal where you know he says that this is not about aesthetics it's not about taste this is the the, the real choosing of something that has no aesthetic value whatsoever and strangely 
these sort of arguments of the avant-garde were then used as an excuse by the non-avant-garde to have to bother with it at all. And you see so vast amount of spaces, not just in the US, but literally everywhere in the world, also in Austria, if you look at the spaces surrounding our old towns that are basically non-spaces, that are bare aesthetics considerations have not entered into the discussion and they become, yeah, I think the best way is they're non-spaces. Like you don't feel any anchor there. You don't feel like you, that you don't feel like being there. You certainly don't feel like spending any time there. And it's, uh, I'm convinced that we are going to get rid of them. If you see something that is authentic and you have a, sincere experience, then it is definitely not kitsch. Even though it might be kitsch to somebody else who might not have that sincere experience, but it won't be kitsch to you. So if, uh, I mean, an easy example is today in the morning, I actually was up early and I watched the sunrise. Now, uh, that was a mildly I, I, I don't say, I can't say that I was in awe, but it was a mildly uplifting experience. I did take a picture of it, and I'm extremely aware that my picture of it will not have the same uplifting effect, and will probably be seen, if I would publish it, as a piece of kitsch. Because ultimately, then you have a sunrise over the Alps, which, through overuse, has lost its meaning. While the actual sunrise, still in its urgency in its nowness had meaning for me. And I think kitsch by definition probably has lost the meaning for you. Now of course with irony, I mean these are complex issues, with irony involved, you know, I mean there were people, Jeff Koons would be an, an example, who made gigantic careers in art by elevating kitsch or by dealing with kitsch uh, as a strategy. Uh, I myself am very much ready for a reintroduction of beauty. Well, I think ultimately we all got extremely tired of the absence of beauty. And if you look at where the best of architecture is going, I think an example that I used was uh, the Elbphole Money in Hamburg. I'm very aware how much more it's going to cost, and I'm very much I'm very aware how long, much longer it took. And I specifically, since I live in uh, the United States, am extremely proud that to see that there are places in Europe that still think that it's worthwhile to spend proper public money to make something that is exceptional. This is how we should go forward. And I'm actually convinced we are not. I'm also convinced that in not the too distant future, we're going to look back at this time in wonder and sort of think, how could we possibly get that so wrong? Because I do think that uh, uh, the human, that humanity very much has a very big capacity to write itself. Yes, we go down wrong, some wrong paths here and there, but ultimately we find out that these paths are wrong and write itself and go and, and go forward.